Hi, and thanks for joining us here today at Concordia Online. We're glad you're here with us, and we know that, that God's going to uh, bless us as, as we study His Word today, um, and, and He moves in our hearts to, to, to know more about Him and what His will is for us, not just as individuals, but as the church body and His calling in our lives. So thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, you know, we're not just a church online, but we are a church here uh, for you, right, for our community. And so uh, having said that, if you want to be involved with what we do or if you have needs that, that we can minister to, please send us an email. Uh, and you can send that email to concordia at clcgrace.org and let us know the need or if you want to be kept abreast of what's going on, what we're doing in our community uh, for the, the sake of God's kingdom, uh, send us an email right there. Uh, we also want to let you know that we're here to pray for you. All right? There's great power in prayer. That's a great gift that God has given his people to pray to him, to come to him at any time. And we want to partner, partner with you in that. So if you would like us to come alongside you in prayer, you can send your prayer request to that same email address. That's concordia at clcgrace.org. Uh, people ask how they can partner with us in the ministry we're doing. You know, again, I keep hearing more and more people being laid off uh, from their jobs during this time or uh, their their jobs being reduced, um, and, and therefore they're finding it harder and harder to, to, to get food, uh, to afford food for themselves and their families. Uh, so if you if you want to partner with that, we're, we're heavily involved right now in, in the food banks in our community, uh, Foothills Foodies, uh, Green Mountain, uh, elementary, their food bank down there, um, the, the Action Center and the, the food donations they give out there daily, hundreds daily. Uh, we'd love for you to partner with us in that as well. You can go to our, uh, if you, so if you would like to, if you'd like to give uh, to the ministry of the church, you can go to our website and go to the Secure uh, Giving tab and you can give there. Again, that's secure. You can give to us, um, to God's Kingdom work um, through texting. Uh, just text the number 84321. And that's a secure way to give as well. You can also mail in your offering. Uh, we've got a secure mailbox, or you can drop it off in our secure mailbox as well. Uh, but whatever you do, I'm glad you've joined us here today. If you would, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you. Thank you for uh, this day, for your presence in our lives. Lord, there's, there's people struggling out there. Um, be with them, Lord. Help us as the church to rally uh, around them, to to hear what you're calling us to do, to step out and to step up and to really be the church that this world desperately needs. Lord, there's many people that are that are celebrating joyous occasions as well, um, anniversaries and birthdays and baptisms, and, and, and there's a lot of good, right? A lot of joyful things. And so we celebrate with them as well, Lord, and we're so grateful for those blessings. Bless our time today, today Lord, that we would be moved, transformed, changed by your word so that we would be equipped to be uh, people who give glory and honor to your name so this world too can come to know who you are and your great love for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, this is the time in our uh, worship together where we we have a, a, a time set aside for confession and absolution. And I I go to this story a lot when we talk about confession and absolution because I, I, I just think it's so powerful. Um, it's the story of of. Peter, he's in the boat with Jesus early in Jesus' ministry, Peter and some other disciples. And they've been fishing, haven't caught anything. And Jesus says, hey guys, toss your net on the other side. And they're like, dude, we've been fishing all night. You know, we know what to do. That's our job, fishermen. We haven't caught anything. We're just going to come in. And Jesus says, just try it. Just throw it on the other side. Oh, well. All right. We will. So they throw the net on the other side large haul of fish and Peter falls down at the feet of Jesus and says, Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinful man, right? He, he knows at that moment that there's something about Jesus, that there's, that he's holy, he's other. Whatever Peter knows, he knows this, that Peter himself is sinful and, and, and doesn't deserve to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And I think oftentimes that's where we are as Christians or just as people, Right? As we come to a realization of our sinfulness, as we recall what we've, you know, how we've hurt our neighbor, how we've said things that, uh, um, that have hurt others, how we maybe have failed to act on behalf of others, how we've harbored that, that sin or that anger or that grudge, right? we've kind of nursed that along. Whatever it is, as that's brought to our mind, I think oftentimes we, we want to push away Jesus. We, we understand our own unholiness and we, we get away from me. That's our inclination, isn't it? 
We're, we're trying to hide something. We, Adam and Eve did that in the garden. They sinned, and, and right away they, they hid, and they, they um, tried to cover themselves up. And that's what we try to, do, try to do too. We understand the holiness of God, and so we try to cover it up. Don't look at this, God. I'm sinful. I, I'm, I don't deserve you. All that's true. All of it is, right? We are sinful. We don't deserve God. We don't deserve his love. We don't deserve his grace. And that's precisely what makes it grace. That's what makes the beauty of the gospel. That's what makes Jesus Christ, this living son of God, so so other, so transformative. Because we deserve nothing from God but condemnation for our sinfulness. But what God does is he comes to us anyway. He comes and he acts on our behalf through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died for our sins. God takes away our sins and gives us new life. He forgives us. Right? Our inclination, our sinful inclination is to turn away and say, get away from me because I don't deserve it. And God's saying, you're right, you don't deserve it. But I want to give it to you. I want to give you grace. I want to forgive your sins. I want you to know me and my love. And that's really what confession and absolution is about. It's about us coming to God in our sinfulness with all the garbage we have and saying, I I deserve nothing from you but wrath and condemnation. For I know your promise that in Jesus Christ you will shower me with grace and forgiveness. That's what confession and absolution is about. We confess our sins and we hear hear God's good news of, of absolution. He he absolves us of our sins. He frees us up. So let's confess our sins now. Most gracious and holy Father, like Peter, all we, we can say is, get away from me. I'm sinful. Get away from me. And yet, Lord, you call us, you tell us to come to you in our sinfulness, not to, not to gloat about it, not, not to say, hey, look, look at my sin, but to bring it to you, Lord, to, to, to be healed from it. And that's why you sent your son. And for that, we are eternally grateful that your son, Jesus, came to die the death that we deserve, to take away our sins and in turn give us new life, give us his righteousness, make us sons and daughters of the living God. Forgive us for our sins. And we are so grateful that in your son, Jesus, you have forgiveness. You have showered us with grace and mercy. You love us and you have forgiven us all things. Thank you. Thank you for the new life that is ours in Jesus. May we live this new life to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How cool is that? I mean, ah, how cool is that? God forgives us all of our sins. That is the good news of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Well, we're, we're in our series, um, Stranger Things. We're, and uh, we're looking at those strange stories in Scripture. Those stories, either we, we kind of skip over because we don't know what to do with them, or they're just, we've read them and we, we, we just don't know what to do with them. They're just so, so strange. Um, well, that's where we are today. The, the title for today's message is You've Got Mail. And while that sounds, you know, kind of light, hey, you've got mail, uh, this story today, this strange story, um, is pretty disturbing. So I just, that's my disclaimer. I'm throwing it out there. Uh, and that's the truth of the Bible, right? God's word, it's, it's real people. It's, it's real stuff. I mean, this is the truth and reality. And so it gets pretty ugly sometimes. It gets pretty messy. And today's story is one of those stories. It's pretty ugly. It's, it's pretty horrific. So stranger things, here's the story. Uh, the story actually takes place in the book of Judges. Um, and it, it covers the last three chapters of Judges. Uh, chapters 19, 20, and 21. Um, and that's a lot to read, so we're not going to read all of that. I'm going to try to kind of encapsulate it for you as, as, as briefly as I can to give you the full story. Uh, but I encourage you to go back and read this. Again, it's in Judges 19, 20, and 21. So here's, here's the story. And again, disclaimer, pretty horrific. It starts out with a, with a Levite, a priest. And the priest is living with his concubine. And basically, let's just, what it is, is this priest living with his girlfriend, right? He's shacking up with his girlfriend and they, they have a falling out and she leaves and goes back home to her, to her dad. And, and the Levite's by himself for a few days. He says, you know what? I'm going to make up with her. So he goes to, to her father's house and, and they're all there and they talk for a few days and, you know, oh, this is great. And 
chit-chatted up. And finally, after a few days, they decided we, we probably need to be getting home. And so the, the priest and his, and his girlfriend, they pack up, but it's late in the day, right? They've waited now until it's late in the afternoon and they decide to go home. And so they start heading home. The problem is since it's so late in the day, it's getting dark. They can't make it home uh, before, before nightfall. So they, they come to this town, Gibeah. And Gibeah is a, is a town in the tribe of Benjamin. Remember, there's 12 tribes of Israel, and Benjamin is one of them. That's where this town is, the, tri- the town of Gibeah. So they, they stop there because they can't go farther because of nightfall, and they want to be safe. Uh, there's really no place for them to stay in the town, so they stay in the town square. And they're ready to, to just kind of bed down for the night, and a guy from the town comes over to him and says, What, what are you guys up to? Uh, and they say, well, we're, we're heading home, but we just can't make it before nightfall. So we just thought we'd spend the night in the town square. And the guy goes, well, this probably isn't the best place for you to spend the night. How about you come home with me? Come home with me and, um, and just spend the night. And I'm like, oh, that's really great. That's really nice of you. Sure. So they head, they head over to this guy's house. Well, then late that night, um, there's, a, there's pounding. There's pounding at this guy's door. And it's some men from the town of Gibeah. And they're pounding on the door and they say to the man of the house, they say, hey, we know you've got somebody in there. We know that, that a man came into town and uh, what we, we want him. We want to, as the Bible tells us, we want to know him. And that's the Bible's way of saying we want to have sex with him. Let, let, let us have him. Send him out here so we can have sex with that man. And the man of the house says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let you do this vile thing. I'm not going to give you this man. Just go away. And they keep pounding, they're, they're persistent. Let us, let us have him, let us have him. And the man of the house says, ready for this? He says, no, I won't give you him. I'm not gonna let you do anything to him, but I'll give you my virgin daughter and I'll give you his girlfriend to do what you want with, with them. And they say, no, no, we want him. So what the priest does is he opens the door quickly and tosses out his girlfriend to them, slams the door shut, locks it. Well, then all through the night, the men of the town, they rape and abuse the priest's girlfriend. Well, the next morning, uh, the priest gets up ready to go. He opens up the door and, and there's his girlfriend on the doorstep. And uh, he nudges her, no movement, steps over her. She's not moving. So he throws her on his donkey and they end up, they, he takes her home. And when they get home, he cuts her up. He cuts her up into 12 pieces. He dismembers her body, cuts her up into 12 pieces, and mails her out to the different tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, when the tribes get these packages, they're they're horrified. Now, what's going on? What happened? How can this take place in our nation, the nation of Israel? What's going on? Well, they finally get to the bottom of it. And they, they go, whoa, this town of Gibeah, what's going on there? And they know it's from the tribe of Benjamin. And so the other 11 tribes say, hey, we're going to fix this, right? We're going to do what's right. We're going to do what's right and we're going to fix this. Well, the tribe of Benjamin's like, whoa, you know, settle down here. You're, you're just not going to come in and do what you want. And they say, well, we're going to do what's right and we're going to take care of this. And so what ends up happening is there's a civil war that breaks out between the one tribe of Benjamin and the other 11 tribes. Now, believe it or not, the tribe of Benjamin holds off the 11 uh, other tribes for a while, but eventually those 11 tribes just decimate, absolutely massacre the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, hundreds of thousands killed. All that's left are 600 men. Everybody else from the tribe of Benjamin, men, women, children, boy, girl, doesn't matter, killed. 600 men took off and they ran to the hills. So that's all that's left of this tribe of Benjamin. And the other 11 tribes are like, we solved it. We took care of that problem. We did what was right. And we took care of that. And you know what? Just to teach them a lesson, just to really show them those 600 guys, you know what? Let's not give them any of our girls, any of our, our, our daughters to marry. Yeah, that'll teach them a lesson. And they felt pretty good about that. They thought they did the right thing. Until they really began to, thought of, until they really began to think about it and they go, huh. Maybe we're a little, a little rash with that vow we just made, right? This promise we made not to give them any of our daughters. Because now, if we don't give them any of our daughters, well, that tribe will just die out. There'll be no more tribe of Benjamin. There will be no more 12 tribes. There'll just be 11. So now what do we do? Well, they started, they, 
started to formulate a plan. They said, you know what? When we went up and fought Benjamin, did everybody from the 11 tribes, all the tribes, all the clans, did everybody come out and fight? Everybody send at least one person to fight? Well, they investigated and they found out that there was one clan that didn't send anybody to fight against Benjamin. One clan didn't send anybody. So they said, oh, problem solved. We'll go wipe out that clan except for their virgin girls and give them those virgin girls as give the tribe of Benjamin those virgin girls as their wives. Problem solved. So they did. They went and, and, and they wiped out that, they killed everybody in that clan except for the virgin women, the virgin girls. And so there's 400 virgin girls that, that were alive, that were left, and they gave them to the 600 men from Benjamin. Now, did you catch that? Are you doing the math? 600 men from the tribe of Benjamin, 400 virgin girls from this clan. And so they start to think, well, now what do we do? And we're still 200 short. How do we, where do we find these women? Because we, we vowed not to give many of our daughters. And so they came up with this idea. They said, well, down in Shiloh, every year they have this festival where the virgin girls run out into the fields and they frolic and they play out there and it's all great. So let's tell those 200 men from Benjamin to go out and lay wait in the fields. And when those girls come out, those, those virgin girls from Shiloh come out there, grab one, right? Grab one. And there you go. That's your wife. And then they, they said, well, what, what about those, those men down there? What do we tell them? They say, well, hey, guys, since we all took this vow not to give them our daughters, just let these guys take your daughters. That way you're not breaking the vow and giving them your daughters. They're just taking them and we'll just call it good. We'll just call it even. And that's what they did. 200 men went down, kidnapped 200 girls, virgin girls, to be their wives. Problem taken care of. We did what was right. Wow. Like I said, a strange story, a strange and disturbing story. <laughs> if you really listen to all, of, all those parts, that's a disturbing story. But you know what? That's really not much more disturbing, if at all, than what we see going on in our world today. I mean, Think about this. There was a 19-year-old girl that was set on fire and burned alive for no apparent reason. Just recently, there was an 88-year-old man beaten to death just randomly by a 16-year-old. Again, no rhyme or reason. And these are just some of the, the top stories, right? Um, what about... What about this, these games that are, that are played, right? These games that individuals or groups play where they assault, they attack a stranger just for fun. And sometimes it results in death, but they do this just for fun because it's, it's a game they play. They just attack random strangers. Or think about this. Since Roe v. Wade, there have been 60 million abortions in the United States. Think about that bloodshed. 60 million abortions in the United States alone. In, in last year, in 2019, 650,000 women, 650,000 women were raped. Those are the ones that are reported. Over 20% of, of, of the male population, boys and men, um, report being sexually abused. In our world, there are whole tribes, clans, and ethnicities today and throughout history that, that are targeted for genocide, targeted to be exterminated. Why? Because they're deemed to be maybe inferior, inferior or lesser than, or because they don't like them, or because your uncle's cousin's grandmother said something mean to my brother's daughter's niece's nephew's aunt one time. And so you're just targeted to, to be exterminated and wiped out. I don't like how you look. I don't like uh, what you eat. I don't like what you wear or whatever, but people are just, whole people are just wiped out from existence. Human trafficking, human trafficking, selling people into slavery, sexual and otherwise, human trafficking and the resulting commercial sexual exploitation. Get this, every year is a multi-billion dollar business. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Those are just the, the, the things that, that, we, that we know of, right? Just the, off the top of our head. I'm sure you have your own stories that you've read about, that you've heard. I hope not, but maybe even you've seen, right? 
or unfortunately maybe even been a part of. But I, like I said, just the tip of the iceberg. What about all those violent outbursts and abuses that happen in our world that are never, ever reported? that no one ever knows about except for the victim and the one perpetrating that? Or what about the lies and the gossips and the addictions that, that we just throw out there that ruin careers or lives or families? What about, what about the, the unchecked and unbridled pride and egotism that runs rampant in our world today? That everybody, man, it, it's, it's about them and they don't care who they have to run over. I mean, you can come up with your own. Turn on your computer, Google, turn on the nightly news and you'll see this. Is, this wow. Talk about stranger stories. And this story today, like I said, like I said, it's a, it's a, it's, we, we've titled this series, Stranger Things. This story today is a stranger thing, but this story today from judges, let's be honest in our world today, it's just another top of the hour news story. It's not that much different than what goes on. In fact, it's no different than what goes on in our world today. So what in the world is going on? What is the problem? Why would Israel do such a thing? Why would, why do they allow such a thing to happen? Why do they be, uh, perpetuate and allow such a thing to happen? And why do those things still happen today? Why do we still participate and allow? And why do those things still happen today? Well, the answer is actually found in that story. Uh, it, it actually bookends our story, in fact. In 19.1, Judges 19.1, we have the answer. And again, that answer is repeated in Judges 21.25. Let me read those for you. <clears throat> Judges 19.1. In those days, Israel had no king. And then over here in Judges 21.25, it says this. In those days... Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. That refrain, which occurs not just as, as the bookends of this story, but occurs uh, at various times and places in the book of Judges, that statement is not just a political comment. This is not just political commentary saying, oh, by the way, they don't have a king. This is a theological diagnosis. God was supposed to be their king and they rejected him. In fact, they flat out say that, that they reject God in 1 Samuel. If you want to go there, uh, 1 Samuel 8, uh, verses 6 and uh, six through 9. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 4. Oh, by the way, I didn't give out points for your Bible today. Hopefully you brought it. If you did, um, then you get 2,000 points, right? It's 4th of July weekend, so you get 2,000 points uh, if you brought your, your own Bible and you're using it today. So here we are. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse, let's start in verse 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You're old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Appoint a king to lead us. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. And they have done from the day, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me. So from the time God brought them out of Egypt until this day, that's all the period of Judges, right? Joshua and Judges up to now. As the time they, as they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you now. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. And then he, then Samuel goes on to tell the people uh, God's warning. The Jews rejected God as their king, and therefore God said, and Samuel tells him this, God says later on, he says, uh, the king who will now rule over them, they don't want me, that's fine, I'll give them another king, but that king who's going to rule over them, He's going, to have their, he's going to have his way with them. In other words, what God's telling them is, it's not going to be pretty. This is not going to be pretty, and it's not going to end well for you. Hence, our story today, our stranger, horrific story today in Judges, and hence, our story today in our world and in our own lives. See, humanity, starting all the way back in Eden, rejected God as their king. And because we have, because we did, because we still do, 
There's a new king who rules over us. There's a new king who has his way with us. And that new king is the devil. And that new king is our own sinfulness that rules over us. And like the Jews, we've rejected God, who is supposed to be our one true king. And we've settled instead for serving these other kings. Satan, our own sinful, selfish desires. And now, as we see, to paraphrase the writer of Judges, everyone, everyone today, does what is right in their own eyes. Now, it might be really tempting for us to say, yeah, yeah, you're right. This is a problem. It's a problem out there, right? It's a problem out in the world. It's a problem that the world has. They've rejected God and, and wow, what a problem they have. It's not in the church. It's out there. Before we go there, let's go back to the story, okay? Because if you read the story, and again, I hope you do, 19 through 21 uh, in Judges, as we go back to that story, what we see in there is that the tribes of Israel, right, the, the 11 tribes warring against Benjamin, they actually do inquire of God, right? They, they, they pray to him. They worship him. They offer offerings up to him. They do this stuff. And so it would seem that, that God is actually their king. It, it would appear that, yeah, everything's great. Everything's, everything's awesome. But read the story. As you read the story, as you begin to dig in, what you find is this, that, that their, their inquiries, their, their prayers, their worships, their offerings to God are really just perfunctory at best. Right? They're, what they're doing, they're just, they're just going through the motions because they've already decided. Again, read the story. They've already decided each and every step of the way what they're going to do. They've already made up, made up their minds. Hey, they're doing these things and inquiring of God, but they've already decided the steps they're going to take. Though they pay homage to God, their true king, their sin, their sinful desires, that, that is their true king. And there's a warning in there for us today that as the church, and more importantly, as individuals, individuals who make up God's church, who make up the body of Christ in this world, we need to be careful that we're not just going through the motions. We need to watch and make sure that we're not cloaking our sin and our sinful desires in, the perfunctory, in our perfunctory worship, in the things we do that we call worship, right? We, praying to God uh, one day, paying homage to Him one day, knowing full well that the next day, we're just going to pursue our own sins, our own lusts, our own greeds, our own self-centeredness, our own pride, right? One day, hey, God, here you go, but we know what we're going to do. We know instead we're going to go our own way. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to give in to our own sinful lusts and prides. We need to be careful and heed Jesus' warning in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, go with me there if you would. Matthew chapter 7, 21 uh, through 23. <clears throat> Jesus says this. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Right? That's what we need to guard against as God's people. That we're not just, as they were in Judges, going through the motions, right? Checking off a box, perfunctory uh, uh, worship. And, and, but all the while, we know we're going we're to pursue our own course of action. We're going to pursue our own sinful desires. We need to watch out. We just can't say, hey, Lord, Lord, remember me. Because he's going to say, dude, I don't. You, you didn't follow me. You didn't, you didn't know me. You didn't follow me. You didn't, you didn't do uh, the will of my Father. That's what we're called to do. See, we're called to, to do the will of God, to do the will of our King. God is to be our King, just as He's Israel's King, so He is now the new Israel's King. Us, all believers, Christians, He is our King. And as our King, we are to do His will. That's what, that's what Jesus says there, right? That to do his will. And what is the will? What is the will of the Father? Well, 
Jesus lays that out for us as well. If you go with me to John chapter 6, verse 40, here's what Jesus says. Um, let's see, verse 40, um, Jesus says this, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him, shall have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. God's will for us, for everyone, is to look to the Son. This is the will of the Father. This is the will of God, to look to the Son, His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is indeed our true King, and Jesus, who is indeed our only salvation, our only remedy, the remedy for our sin. And as we look to Jesus as our true king, we find what we desperately need. We find hope. We find restoration. We find the way, the truth, and the life. What we find is that he has given us a new heart, a heart that is set on Jesus as its king, on his desires, on his purposes, on his kingdom, a heart that is not set on its own desires, but a heart that is set on the new life that we have in Christ, a heart set on serving others, a heart that speaks with truth and grace, a heart that is filled with compassion, a heart to feed the hungry, to to clothe the naked, to quench the thirsty, to see, a heart to see the lost saved, a heart that doesn't seek its own good, its own desires, but the good of others, a heart that is willing to pick up its cross and die to self because it knows that that's the only way to live. You know, in our world today, we hear an awful lot about change, about how how we need to change, how people need to change, how things need to change. And we're told that the way for this change to happen is through uh, institutional change, that there's there's an institutional problem. And, And Maybe, but here's the deal. The truth of the gospel is this, that real, lasting, meaningful change only happens in the hearts of individuals. That's what the gospel says, right? We're talking about changing you know, institutions, but change only happens in the hearts of individuals. It has to start with us. And now this doesn't mean that, that Christians shouldn't be involved in, in the affairs of the state, in the political arena. Of course we should. Right? Of course we should. Just because we're talking about change needs to happen in the hearts of individuals doesn't mean, okay, let, let's stay out of the world. Of course not. We, we, should, we should be involved in the political process. We have a voice. right? We have the voice of Christ we need to bring to that. So yes, we need to be. And yes, our voices need to be heard. Our voices that are laden with grace and truth, we need to allow our voices to be heard out there for sure. But here's the thing. True, lasting change only happens for the individual and for society when we encounter the gospel. It is only the gospel. It is only Jesus himself that can change the individual and therefore can change the society. That's where change really happens. And that's the only place, that's where it has to start. If we want to see society change, it has to start with the hearts of individuals. It has to start with us. It has to start with us saying, Jesus, you are my king. So let it be said of you. Let it be said of you that in these days, that in these days, Jesus is your king and that you did through the power of the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit what was right in his eyes. And that's probably enough for today. We're going to enter into our time of communion. Uh, so if you, have, if you don't have the elements nearby, uh, I would encourage you to grab those right now. And as you're getting those, I just want to remind you that if you have anybody with you, whether they be children or, or an adult or somebody else who's not um, going to take communion today, then I encourage you, please do say a blessing over them uh, to let them know that, that they too um, are dearly loved uh, by God, a, a, his chosen child. So please make sure that you do that. We begin now, uh, we continue now with the words of institution. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to his, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. 
This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to the disciples and he said, Take and drink all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray now together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take eat. This is my body. Take drink. This is my blood. And now, may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. I hope you were blessed by our time. Remember, there is only one king. It's not you. <laughs> certainly isn't me. There's no one else who deserves that place, who, who owns that that place, whose rightful place that is to sit on that throne as our king, and that is Jesus Christ. No doubt, you might want to put something else there. <laughs> you and I might want to put something else there. We might allow something or someone else to sit there, but it's not going to end well. Jesus, Jesus is our true king, and it's in our king that we find real, true, lasting life. He brings the change that we so desperately need. Let's go be change agents for this world. Have a great day.